My name is Tim Story. They call me the life coach to the stars. You're listening to CIA. It's a podcast, Contagious Influencers of America. I am with my good friend, nine-time Emmy Award winner, and his name is David Sams. How are you doing today, David? I could not be better, Tim. Before we get started here, because I know we are going to feature somebody today on the show who you're really close with. Very close You, you introduced me to her. As a matter of fact, I saw her at one of your Tim Story Live events. Yes, in Beverly Hills. And boy, she just brought down the roof. I told Denise, my associate, I said, we have got to book her on the show. We interviewed her. We got a lot of material. The phones rang off the hook. So we've decided to really feature her on today's podcast. It's just remarkable to me. Every time I look around the corner, you introduce me to somebody who blows my mind. Where do you come up with all these amazing people? These mind-blowing people? Yeah. Well, I think that like attracts like, because I feel the same thing about you. I mean, the people that we have on this show already, I mean, think about the list. Just give us three people that have been on our program. So uh, Mark Burnett, uh, the, the creator of uh, Shark Tank, The Apprentice, The Voice, uh, Survivor, his wonderful wife and producing partner, Roma Downey. We've had the women uh, that uh, created Trim Healthy Mama, which has become a huge movement to let the bondage of food just be the doors blown off. That's Trim Healthy Mama with Serene and Pearl. We've had God Hamilton. Scott Hamilton. Oh, my yes. gosh. I mean, I grew up loving this guy. Yes. Right? America did. What a skater. But every year, his his talents, his gifts, his inspiration just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the way, you know he's still fighting a, a brain tumor. Yes. I mean, this has gone on four or five times in he's, his life. He's courageous. He's so he, courageous. He's had setbacks and keeps having comebacks. Yeah. But to answer your question, is it like does attract like? That's why it's important to be the person that you want to attract. And as no, you right. as, as you get healthy, you're going to draw healthy people. But Patrice Washington is phenomenal at what she does. She has a book called Real Money Answers for Every Woman, but it's also for men as well. Her husband, Gerald Washington, one of my best friends in the world, runs many, many of the shows for Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey Show, Little Big Shots, so many of the shows that you see on the air. So it's a very strong power couple. But uh, now, now I see the connection because you've also done a lot with Steve Harvey. I'm doing a lot with Steve Harvey. Yeah. And currently we've been doing a tour uh, that Patrice Washington is also on. And then I do Steve Harvey Facebook Live every single Monday. Oh, wow. And other projects with Steve, yes. Wow. So anyway, today we are interviewing Patrice Washington, and she's going to give us some amazing factoids. Tell me something that you liked about the interview. She has this thing down to a science. Yes. I mean, she she's not just a, an inspirational speaker. And, and by the way, let's remember, and I, and I think that this is one thing that makes her unique, it's one thing that made Dave Ramsey unique because Dave Ramsey went through uh, bankruptcy. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Patrice had it all, lost it all. I think yes. she went from a uh, how many thousands of square feet home to a, a one-bedroom apartment at one mm -hmm. point, right? She sure did. So she had to get back up on her feet again. You know, it's one thing for somebody to give us uh, you know, their two cents worth. It's another thing for us to feature folks who have been to hell and back. And I like this because I think that in Patrice's case, it makes people very empathetic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Don't you feel more sympathetic and empathetic and compassionate? Absolutely. Because you've been through pain? Yeah. Uh, and Me too. I, I totally related uh, to uh, uh, what she and, – and by the way, she revealed – uh, a, a story that I'm going to leave for the for the interview I did with her. She revealed uh, a couple of things about uh, how she was going to give a speech at one point as they were uh, uh, getting ready to introduce her oh, to yeah. her. They were building her up in front of this huge audience at this convention, and she's just sitting there thinking to herself, uh, you know what, I don't know who they're talking about. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. The build-up, the build-up, the oh, build-up. Yeah. And she got up there, and she just – told it like it is and yes. told the truth. And that's what's really cool here is that we have the opportunity to share stories. You know, we have all lived lives that uh, are very, very imperfect, very uh, at some point 
all over the place for me. We're uh, living life. We're living life. You just life. called it as it is. We're yeah. living We're living life. Life. Right. You know what? I'm happier since we started doing this podcast. The podcast is changing people. We're getting good feedback. Yeah. No, great feedback. People are emailing us. Yeah. People are talking to us about it. People are saying, thank you for doing this. Okay. You got enough going on. I got enough going on. But we want people to catch this contagious energy as we bring you influencers. Why are we doing this? Because influencers will bring impact to your life. Some of you are one conversation away from something wonderful happen. And this is the conversation today. Something great is about to happen in your life. So here's the interview I recently did with Patrice Washington. So, Patrice, I saw you at uh, Tim Story's live event in Beverly Hills, and I just had to have you here. You just bring it on. That's right. You are so real. You've lived it. That's what it is. You've lived it. I watched your videos, and your one video on faith is what just set me off. The one where you were uh, asked a question, and you went up on stage. What happened was I was receiving an award down in Atlanta, and it was for basically the Claire Huxtable Award. So this woman who carries her professional life and personal life with style and grace and makes it look easy. And they had done an exercise for um, one of the panels before, and it said something like, um, you wouldn't know by looking at me, but... And so I was going up to receive this reward for being essentially perfect in, in, the lot, in the eyes of the young women who were in the audience. And I'm like, I can't do that. There's something in me saying you can't just accept this award and act like you don't know what you've been through. And I started to share with them, you know, you wouldn't know by looking at me that although I'm blessed to have a 10 year old daughter, I held my son in my arms for five hours until he took his last breath. You know, and went through the devastation of losing a child really early on. You know, you don't know by looking at me when you see the Christmas pictures with my family in matching pajamas that the seven-year itch was real. My husband and I didn't even, we almost didn't even make it to this point, but by the grace of God. You know, and I started to go through what it was like to sleep on my brother's couch. See, now you see me on national television and you think, oh, look at, this is so cool. Look at her life. No, no, no. There's a lot that's happened in between the glory days that you might see now. And there was a lot there. And I, I thought I would be doing women a disservice if I just went from glory to glory and didn't share with them those valley moments. And I let it all out. <laughs> I let it all out there. And one of the lessons that I've learned and why faith is so important to me, even though, you know, I'm known as a financial expert, um, one of the pillars for wealth for me is faith. And I always tell people, you know, what I've realized is that none of these things happen to me. They happen for me. And every time I've been through something, I've been like, God, what is the lesson I'm supposed to learn from this? Or, you know, yeah, things have been blessings all along the way. But when those times get hard and difficult and you feel like just giving up, I'm like, God, what is the lesson I'm supposed to get? And every time I surrender and open myself up to what that lesson might be, that's the thing that keeps me going, and that's the only reason I'm here. And you learned something from that, your sort of 80-20 rule. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. So with the 80-20 rule, it's essentially that with anything that happens, it's only 20% about what actually happens, and the other 80% is how we respond. Like we get a choice with anything that happens to tell a different story. And one of the things that I've learned is that I am so much more empowered when I choose the story. We all get to choose the story, but so many of us have learned negative ways of being, right? You, if you grew up in a household where people were complaining and whining and saying, well, it's me all the time and, you know, oh, it's the economy. Oh, it's the president. Oh, it's this. It's that. You never learn to take responsibility, right? Because you have a choice in, in any of this. You may have not chosen the circumstances, but you have a choice of how you respond to it. And we get to choose. So why not tell a better story? You have your six pillars that create a foundation to creating wealth. Yeah. 
Tell me, tell me about those. I would go all over the country and people would be, you know, tugging at me after I would speak somewhere and they'd go, well, I really just need help with the budget. You know, I really just need help with my credit report. If I knew the credit bureaus, all my woes would go away. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, that is not true at all. The skill set piece of money is important. But again, another 80-20 rule. It's only 20% of it. 80% is us. It's our mindset. It's our behavior. You have to do more than look at your budget every day. You just do. You have to do more than print down your credit report every month. Those things are necessary, but they're a piece. They're not the whole puzzle. And so when I created the six pillars of wealth, it was really, first of all, me saying, I want to take a stand and tell the truth about wealth. Because if you think that it's only about money, you're missing it. And from the time that I lost everything in the recession, I went from this seven-figure business to literally losing everything in the recession over 18 months and scraping up change. And I say to people, nine years later, I am known as America's money maven. But if you think that's because the only thing that I've done is get a budget, you're sadly mistaken. Not only this time, but the first time that I created that seven-figure business straight out of college, I was very intentional about the other areas of my life. But a lot of times I would be timid to share it. You know, I would be like, no one wants to hear that, or they'll think that's hokey, or they'll, they don't want to hear about my faith, or they don't want to hear about relationships. But I had to tell the truth. You know, I had to keep it real that there were actually other pieces to this. And so, yes, there are six pillars. And the first pillar is just being fit. And people always go, oh, my gosh, she wants me to go to the gym. No, it's not so much about that. Being fit is about be becoming your best self. And I always tell people so often on our journeys to building wealth, we think that it's all about um, the hustle and grind and just and just the chasing money. We're not eating. We're not sleeping. We're not listening to our bodies. We're not taking care of ourselves. We're running ourselves in the ground, but then we're praying for God to give us more territory. It's like, well, you can't really manage the territory that you have. You know, it's about capacity. So I always tell people being fit is about physically making sure that whatever it is you are seeking, that you actually have a choice to enjoy it, that you have a choice to reach retirement, right? And go and live on an island somewhere else. If you're not taking care of yourself, you may never see that day, especially in today's society where we are just so stressed and overworked and dealing with tons of traffic and it's just so much. You may never get there. So how do you set your life up to really focus on you and sometimes just take time to be still? Um, take take care of your mental health. You know, that's another big thing. Uh, you may have heard me say this before, but I grew up feeling very ugly. And I was told by several people in my family all while growing up that I was the ugly one in the family. And I really took that on. So while I knew I was a smart kid, uh, I really depended on that, but always had self-esteem issues with my looks. And I had to go to therapy for that. And a lot of times as believers, we don't want to go to therapy because we think, oh, I'll just pray about it and it'll go away. But when I look at my life today, when I look at being on national talk shows and writing several books with my picture on it and doing all of the amazing work that I get to do today, had I not gone to therapy and dealt with some of that childhood trauma, there's no way I could stand in the gifts that God gave me. There is, it would be impossible because I would still be so timid and scared of people seeing me that I would not walk out my purpose the way that I should. And my purpose is what's led to my prosperity. You want me to keep going? Yeah, <laughs> give, give, give me number two. So the second pillar is all about people. And I think you know this really well, that it's all about building relationships that matter. You know, and when we are on that journey to creating wealth, to building that business, to going to the top in our, you know, climbing that corporate ladder, if you will, a lot of times we're kind of taught that it's all about us, like do whatever you have to do to get to the next level. And sometimes we think that's building relationships. But when you really look at it, are you using the people that you like? Are you authentically building relationships with people just for the sake of the relationship? Or are you the type of person that as soon as you meet someone, you have to make an ask? There's no giving. There's no contribution. There's no saying, what can I do to support you? You're immediately into making the ask, and it's all about you. And one of the things that I've learned on my journey to creating wealth is so many things have been attracted to me because of how I treat people, because of how I 
make every attempt to invest in other people. How can I support you? What can I connect you with? Is there anything that I could do to help you get you know, to the next level in your dream. And just by virtue of being that way, I have been put in front of amazing people with amazing opportunities, not because I asked, not because I said, hey, choose me, not because I'm constantly trying to pitch myself. Most of the opportunities that I have, I haven't pitched myself for. They've been delivered to me, you know? And it's all because of a love for people. And relationships that matter are so key. And sometimes when we're chasing money, we forget that. And I just want people to know that if you would stop and say, how can I give to someone else? You would be amazed at what would come your way. So you don't have to chase money to get to the next level. You can attract anything that you need if you would just show up in other people's lives the way that you should. That's powerful. I mean, just being a people magnet uh, means mm-hmm. that you, you're just giving to them. And, and the more you give to them, the more that you're getting. And I found that to be the case in my life. It's amazing you have the ability to not look at yourself in the mirror mm-hmm. and, and look at others. It's just amazing how magnetic you become. Yeah. You know? It's it's I, incredible. I love, I just absolutely love mentoring young people. Mm-hmm. Now, by the way, they have to be willing and mm-hmm. they have to be smart. If they don't want to participate, I don't, I'm an old guy now. I don't have the patience. <laughs> well, I'm a young girl and I don't have the patience. <laughs> But and, when they do, it's yeah. amazing, the magic. Well, you know what I always tell people, too, when you're seeking out, you know, mentors, you have to show interest. Like, you have to show that you are ready to humble yourself and be open to the guidance and, and come to the table prepared. Because I mentor a lot of young people, too. And the worst thing is to get on a call or get on a Skype, and they're like, so tell me what you do. I'm like, wait a minute, there's Google for that. Like, tell you what I do. Are you crazy? You know, it's like you have to be prepared. And I always research who I'm going to be in front of. I all if I have if I'm privy to that information beforehand, I'm always researching and looking at who I'm going to be in front of, because how else will I know if I can add value? How else will I know what I can contribute? And if we have an opportunity to chat or our paths cross, I want you to know that I already believe in what you do or and vice versa. I don't believe in what you do. And so if you ask me to participate, everything is not a great fit for me. And I'm aware of that as well. You know, so I always tell young people, you know, come to the table with something. People want to pour into you. There's no shortage of that. Like if someone has ever said, oh, people are only selfish. They only care about themselves. That's not true. They would love to pour into you. But who are you being like? How are you showing up? And one of the my favorite things I always say about the people pillar is that there's always someone watching you who has the power to bless you. But what are they watching you do? You yeah, know, that's good. That's what are good. they that's watching powerful. you do? Next pillar. The next pillar is space. And space is about setting up your life to support you. And what I love about space is it's one of these things that we overlook so often. You know, when you think about your environment, I always say, look around wherever you are right now. If you're in your car, if you're in your office, if you're in your home right now, look around. Does your space reflect who you have prayed to become? Like, I had to ask myself at one point in my basement home office back in the day, is this the home office of a wealthy woman? Is this the is this the home office of a woman who will be a best-selling author? Is this the, you know, am I putting myself in my aspir- aspirational reality as best I can? And a part of that is just setting up my life to support me. It's about organizing, you know, it's about beautifying your space so that you wake up with joy and gratitude, like, wow. And it's not about being in a big house because I started doing this in an apartment, really. When I lost everything and I found myself on the floor, like bawling and crying and sobbing and asking God why. And I found that scripture, Proverbs 17, 16, what good is money in the hands of a fool if they have no desire to seek wisdom? One of the things that came to me with this whole talk of wisdom and and knowledge, well, knowing the difference between knowledge and wisdom, knowledge is information and wisdom is how you apply it. I started to look around my space and just say, are you going to the next place? You know, the way this is set up, I didn't have much, but I cleaned up that bathroom. I got a new shower carton from Target and I made it just as nice as it could be because I wanted it to reflect what was next, not where I was, you know. And one of the things we don't recognize is clutter is known as the physical manifestation of chaos in your mind. 
And a lot of times when we're stuck in a certain area of our life, if we took a, a look around the physical area that represents that, you know, you'll see that, man, maybe I'm not making any progress here because I, I, there's too much. There's too much in my environment. There's too much clutter. You know, I want to have, I, I don't know, I want to, I would say maybe like you want to lose weight or something, right? You go in your closet and it's full of clothes that are way too small and way too big because you're in between, right? And it's keeping you stuck because you kind of have one foot in one part of who you were and then you have one foot of what you might be one day or who you, it's too much. And if you would just get all of that out of the way, you could breathe. You could take in like what is next for me. There is so much clarity in removing clutter and the other thing is I find a lot of times that people buy the same things over and over again simply because they can't find it. And that's definitely a waste of money. You know, I think that's money that you could put towards savings or debt elimination. But when you're not organized and when you're, you know, spinning your wheels, looking at the same stuff, looking for the same things over and over, that's time wasted. That's energy wasted. And it could have been put towards something more productive. So that's the space pillar. Well, I like that one, especially especially when I think about my space is going to be on the beach. So yes. In Aruba. <laughs> <laughs> the next pillar is faith. And faith is about believing in something greater. And I've, I've been a lot of places over the last several months where people were asking me, but if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, why would you put faith forth and not faith first? And the truth is, I believe that sometimes... Even as believers, we use faith as a cop-out to not do the work. I have found that a lot of times that we will pray about a thing over and over again. We'll say, oh, I gave it to the Lord. And then we expect everything to just fall into place. But faith without works is dead. And so even though faith is the first part, faith without works, I wanted us to focus on the work. How can we show up? What are the things that we can do so that when life happens... Because we all know that life is that life is going to happen. There are going to be things that come along your path. There are going to be hurdles and distractions and, and haters and enemies and things that come to disrupt your purpose. But when you've been already doing the work, right, you're in such a better place. Like you're more prepared to handle those things that come your way. Um, and so faith is about just remembering that life happens for you not to you. And everything that comes our way is to teach us a lesson. But when you don't have anything greater that you're depending on, I just don't know how people do it. You know, when I lost my son, I, I joined a few mommy groups of women, support groups of women who had also lost children, stillbirth or miscarriages or, you know, anything of the sort. And it was really clear to me early on that I couldn't stay in these groups because left and right, the, the chats were, why would God do this to me? I hate God. I, you know, I, I don't understand. And, and even though I didn't understand, I believed in something greater. You know, I had written a, a letter, an email to my clients at the time, to my family, went out to over 100 people. And the title of it was, My Baby Is Gone to Heaven. And I was explaining to them because I kind of disappeared. I was on bed rest and then I had the baby. He passed after five hours and I was explaining to them what happened. And one of the things that I said in that email was that I know that God wouldn't do this to tease me, to hurt me, to break me. There's got to be a lesson. There's got to be something in this. And now I believe that everything that I've been through um, is really because I'm supposed to be a blessing to others that sometimes they're not strong enough, you know, that don't have examples of people who have overcome. So every time I go through something difficult, I honestly say, okay, I got to I gotta be the testimony because someone's going to need to hear it. And I believe that God can trust me with the testimony. And I accept that. I accept that. And for me, it's just been a different way to look at struggle, to look at, and, and again, it makes you change the story. So it goes from being all about me to being about who is the woman I'm going to meet one day that needs to hear this story and needs to know that there is life after loss. Because a year later, almost to the day I had my daughter. And I think about the bitterness 
that a lot of women kind of keep themselves in and the route that it goes and how that may contribute to not getting what it is they say they want. But in my journey, I've learned that you have to be okay with surrendering. And we're so selective with our surrender, you know? When things happen, it's like, God, you can take my family, but I got to do my business. Like, you don't, you don't get to be CEO, CEO of my business, you know, or you can take over my health. I trust you with my health, but not my finances. Like, I got to do my finances. It's, I've learned to surrender. I've learned to say, you know what, there's something bigger at play here. And as long as I make sure that I do my part to be in alignment, to be still, to listen to the still small voice instead of, you know, acknowledging God, but then looking for answers in everyone else, which we do a lot. You know, it, oh, I have to get, you know, I have to hear it from this person or they if they don't do this or if this person doesn't. I've learned to be still and say, God, what would you have me to do? And I've taken everything and said, all right, this is going to bless someone one day. You must have given it to me because you trust me. It's going to bless someone. And <sighs> So how did you lose your son? My son was born prematurely. I had him at 24 weeks and uh he, when he was born, his eyes were still fused shut. You know, his skin hadn't been fully developed. And they have, to this day, no real explanation for me. I didn't have anything in particular. I was a 25-year-old, perfectly healthy young woman. I had just, I had an amazing business at the time. I had just been approved for a million-dollar life insurance policy. And you know how that goes, because they poke and prod and test everything. And I had just been approved for that, got pregnant like a month later, and then had him early prematurely. But my daughter was also born prematurely. I fell down the stairs in our home when I was about 20 weeks with my daughter. And, <laughs> and I got to the hospital and they said, baby's coming today. And this was almost a year later. And I said, oh. and I just started praying. I just started praying. I wouldn't receive it. You know, I was like, oh, I don't, I, I get what you said, but I don't receive that. I don't receive it. And she held on. She didn't come. She just kind of held steady. And after two days in the ER, they said, okay, we're going to admit you. And they finally really admitted me and put me on the maternity ward. And, and the doctor said, every day she bakes is, is better. And so I had been in the hospital for a few weeks. And at that time, I was a real estate and mortgage broker. And that was 2007. And the real estate market was starting to crash. And I was in the hospital wearing this monitor around my waist to monitor the baby and all that stuff. And uh, I was looking at the news every day. And freaking out because my industry was crashing and I was in the hospital and I could do nothing. And I had 16 people on my team and everyone was used to me being the fixer and being able to come to me. And here I am laid up at Cedar sinai And uh, I was watching the news one day and I, I saw someone that I actually knew, <laughs> one of the bank representatives, and they had chains on the door of his office and the news people were out there interviewing the workers who had no idea that they were going to come to work and their business was gone. And when I saw the guy that I know, I was like, oh my God, you know, that's when it really hit like, oh my gosh, this is it. And my doctor came in that day and she said, I don't know what you're stressing about, but if you don't stop, you're going to leave here two years in a row with no baby. And I said, that was one of those surrendering moments. Mm -hmm. And I said, can you have them take the TV out? Can you have, and they came, maintenance came, little old school box TV in the swivel. And they came and they did their thing and they took that TV out of the room. And I told my husband, we've had 800 credit scores. We've had matching Range Rovers. We've had nice homes. We've traveled all over the place. But I want this baby more than I want any of that. I'm not going to leave here two years in a row with no baby. And he said, I got it. I will not let anyone else call you, bother you, stress you out. And I asked my mom to bring me a journal, which I have to this day, a little red journal. And my husband brought me an iPod full of praise music. And I praised and I rewrote a lot of 
praise and worship songs with my daughter's name in it. And I sung to her every day. And we were just in the car the other day. She's 10 years old. She still came prematurely at 30 weeks, but she barely stayed in the hospital three weeks because she was strong mm. and she was healthy. She was, she was awesome. And now she totally runs the house and runs everything. <laughs> but, um, we were in the car just the other day, last Sunday, driving to church. And one of the songs that I used to sing to her as a baby came on. And she instantly, even when she was a baby, if she would cry, if I would start singing this song, she recognized it immediately. And that was it. And when I did come out of the hospital, my life was totally different. But I had my baby. And and if you, I, you know, I told God, if you do it, you know, if you've done it before, you can do it again. If you have the mindset, you can figure it out again. But I like I can't keep getting pregnant and losing babies. Like that's not a part of the plan. And and I was young. I was 25, 26 years old. And that was one of the first times that I realized that money wasn't everything. You know, money money wasn't everything. I had made my business my baby. I had made chasing money, you know, for me. And not because you know, people wake up going, I want to chase money, you know, but that's what we're groomed to do. Go to college, get a good job, you know, stay there forever, get a good, you know, and we're kind of groomed to just focus on that and not look at all the other parts of life that we're so blessed, you know, to have at our fingertips. And, um, you know, she's still my only baby, to, the, but she's my best friend. I love her to pieces. Mm. I actually like her as a person. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So let's continue with the blueprint. Pillar number five. So the fifth pillar is work, and it's all about living in your life's purpose. And one of the things that I've realized after years of helping people with their personal finances is that it's never really about the money. It's usually about how they feel about themselves or some area of their life. So I always say that financial mismanagement is often caused by lack of fulfillment. And if you're not fulfilled in what you do day in and day out, that's a problem because that's how we end up on Fridays taking our paycheck and going to the mall and saying, well, I worked hard and I deserve it. You know, you're frustrated with your boss, with your supervisor, with your coworkers. And so you're looking for an outlet and stuff. And when you know what your purpose is and you can walk in that purpose, it helps you set your priorities. It helps you if there's a side business you want to start, you're no longer spending your money on new shoes or on a new purse. You're looking to invest that into your blog or invest that into a new website or artwork or whatever you need to move your initiative forward. And so I always tell people, maybe you are not able to work in your purpose immediately. And this is not about entrepreneurship because everyone is not cut out for entrepreneurship. You can work in your purpose and be in someone else's business, that's okay. But if you can't do that yet for any reason, I started out volunteering. When I lost everything and I was starting over, I looked for financial education nonprofits down in Atlanta and I volunteered. And through volunteering, I was eventually offered a position. And then that led to me, you know, having the funding because I, I called my job, um, you know, my number one funder, you know, and it was it's what allowed me to self publish my books. It's what allowed me to do my first website and get started. So how can you really think about what your gifts are? you know, and how that can connect to what your purpose is. And I found my purpose really through the pain of not knowing what to do. You know, the pain of getting into credit card debt, because those are not the conversations I was having, you know, around the dinner table, which I never even ate at. I didn't eat at a dinner table with anyone. Like I wasn't having those conversations. And so the pain of going through credit card debt is what made me go, man, how do you fix this? How do I help other people not have this experience. And so I took my gifts, which were speaking and writing and, you know, doing kind of talent work on talent work and stuff like that. And I partnered it with that pain and said, I can turn this into educating others. I can turn this into helping other people. And so one of the things that I've learned, I learned this from someone recently that purpose is there's two types. One is ultimate purpose, which a lot of us focus on. You know, whenever we want to do something, especially in work, we're so committed to like, it has to look like this. There's this big picture. But what I've learned recently is that purpose can also be seasonal. So thinking about what can I do in this season to just advance myself and looking at that as a win, because we're not, 
I don't feel like I'm completely in control of how I get there. Like I'm committed to the big vision that I feel that God's given me and the purpose that's on my life, but I'm not attached to how I get there. I'm not attached to it because every day I'm being exposed to new things. I'm being exposed to new people, to new opportunities. And so sometimes we get frustrated with the work pillar because we have it all laid out and we have this master plan and we feel like it needs to look exactly like this to go, you know, the way I wanted to. But the fun is in kind of not knowing and just taking the next best step. And so the work pillar is about really honing in on what your purpose is, what you feel your God-given purpose is, and trying to express it every day, whether you get to do it on the job or in volunteering, because sometimes you know what your gift is and you get sidetracked because you because it's not making you the money that you want yet or it doesn't feel like it. But sometimes you could be using the right gift in the wrong ministry or the right gift in the wrong industry or using the right gift with the wrong people because they don't necessarily value it or appreciate it yet. But that doesn't mean that you're not in purpose yet. Maybe you just have to make a shift. I saw the video on your website where you really where you really dig and you help people define their purpose. So when you're looking to figure out what your purpose is, I look at three things. First of all, what are your gifts? So gifts are those things that you do easier than anyone else around you with the least amount of effort. It comes to us so naturally, sometimes we take it for granted, you know, because this is great for you or you can explain it or you love it or you have joy with it. But for the rest of us, it's kind of hard. So that's a gift. But then we need to look at your skill set. And your skill set is what experiences have you had? What type of education? What did you get a degree in or a certification in? What types of jobs have you had? What, like, what are the different things over the course of your life that are themes that kind of keep coming up, right? And then looking at how you partner those two in the marketplace, how you tell the story. And a lot of times we get a little sidetracked or thrown off because we think people don't get it. Like, I want to do this, and I see others out there doing it, but why don't they get me? Sometimes it's just that you're not telling the story well. You're not bridging it together. So when I looked at how I was going to come up with my purpose, the first thing I looked at was my gifts. And my gifts were writing and speaking and just kind of, you know, having a bubbly personality and showing up. Those things came easily to me, but what would I apply them to? And so when I thought about what to apply it to, I looked at my skill set, and that was, okay, I went to college, was a business major, emphasizing entrepreneurial studies. I always loved numbers. I always loved, you know, math and statistics. I was the nerd that actually liked econ. Who like, you know, who <laughs> likes econ? Not many of my friends did, but I loved it, and I gravitated towards it. I loved personal finance. Once I really got into it, it was like my jam, but no one else wanted to talk about it with me. You know, like in my family, they were uninterested, but my friends would go, hey, can you help me set up a budget? Or like, this is what I was thinking about. Can you help me kind of decipher what all this means? And it came to me easily, but that was also my skill set. So the gifts, the skill set, and then the marketplace, when I lost everything and I decided that what I felt called to do was really restore hope to people who had gone through a lot financially and just needed to know you can overcome. Like you could pick yourself up and, and go higher than you ha even were in the first place. You know, I was a poster child for financial loss. I went through every possible financial loss you can experience. I was a poster child for it. But when I wanted to come into the marketplace, what I thought I needed to do was hide my story. I thought if they, if people know that I've been through bankruptcy, if they know that I experienced a foreclosure, if they know that I had a car repossessed, if they know all of that stuff, why would they listen to me? But what I heard the Holy Spirit say is that's why they're going to listen. Because if, if, I mean, you were raggedy, so, <laughs> you know, they might have less than would happen to you. So if that's the case, you know, they can see themselves in you. They could be relatable to what you've been through. Who are you not to? You've overcome. You've gone through it. Why can you not share that? So that was tapping into that pain to connect to the purpose. And the last pillar. The last pillar. Out of all of this, six pillars on wealth. And the very last pillar is money. And money for me is about attracting the wealth that you desire. So for me, I used to lead with money, you know, as a personal finance expert, I always went with the money stuff. How do you budget? How do you save? How do you eliminate debt? And I realized that if I didn't teach you the first five pillars, you would never do the work. 
to get to the money. You would have all the information, all the knowledge that you need, but you wouldn't have the wisdom to use it. You wouldn't have the wisdom to put it into place and it wouldn't be sticky enough for you. You know, you wouldn't be committed to it. And a lot of people who make financial goals in general, they're interested. It sounds good to say, I want to be out of debt. All your friends are saying, I want to buy a house or I'd like to start a business. It just sounds nice. Far too many people are interested. They're not committed. And so my goal was to do the first five pillars so that I could help you build up the muscle. And once you get through all of that, now let's talk about all the other stuff that you think it's about. And my goal is really just to help people use financial tools wisely. But here's what I always tell them. You already know what to do. You've heard the basics. If you would just do the basics, you'd probably be fine. You know, like if you like they say, Big Mama used to say, um, you know, uh, spend less than you earn. You know, don't put up ten dollars out of every hundred dollars you have or save a dollar from every ten dollars you have. You know, don't invest in things that you don't understand. Like don't co-sign on things that you cannot afford to pay yourself because most people who co-sign end up paying for it or it goes on their credit. Right. Don't lend money you can't afford to give. Like there's so many elements to this. And a big one that I think we miss is just nurturing the relationship with money. I feel like a lot of us disrespect the money we do have. And when I feel that when you're not gratitude for what in gratitude for what you do have, why should you receive more? You know, if you don't open your mail now, <laughs> you know, if you don't look at your bills now, if you don't budget what you have, none of these things are miraculously going to be better when you make more money. So if you think, oh, when I get a raise, when I get a promotion, if this, if that, it's not true. You know, who you are with $100 is who you are with $100,000. You're not all of a sudden going to know what to do. But when you build the muscle based on where you are, Right. When you get more money, you're already in the habit of doing the right things. We have it backwards. We think when I get money, then I'll do it. No, you do it now in preparation for what you know is to come because what you nurture grows. And so with anything, when you show respect to a relationship, when you show respect to your spouse or your children or your friends or your coworkers, those relationships are always better. And you don't have to force them to be better. They're just better, right? They just work out a lot better. Same thing with money. When you disrespect the money you have, why would it grow? Well, thank you, Patrice. And thanks for that incredible blueprint. For more information, you can go to P-A-T-R-I-C-E Washington.com. And of course, her book, which is on Amazon, and it's a killer, is called Real Money Answers for Every Woman. This is Tim's story. Wow, what a amazing interview with Patrice Washington. And David Sams, one of the things that I got from it is that when she was down, 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 down financially, she actually thought about giving up. And so uh, part of this segment that we're about to do is we're going to talk about David Sams facing his Goliaths. And in, in opening up, David, about your own life, when you have had times where you've had a lot, where you've had much, and all of a sudden you found that you were struggling financially, she talked about this, Patrice, that she began to get discouraged, frustrated, intimidated. Tell me some of the emotions that you went through when you found yourself in a very tough situation, even financially. Scared. Yes, that is probably the first and foremost scared. I don't know if this is a guy thing or if it's across the board. Uh, you feel like a failure. Mm -hmm. uh, you feel concerned about what other people are going to think. Yes. I, I think that's a big one. It's, 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 it's gigantic. Yeah. Most, mostly when you're used to having money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, let's say restaurants, because you, you, you love restaurants. We both get to travel. So now you have to actually think about what restaurants you're going to go to because you can't afford mm -hmm. the ones you used to go to. Mm -hmm. Did that mm -hmm. ever happen to you? Yeah, I think it's restaurants. I think it's what you wear. I think it's, uh, you know, I really don't need that uh, pair of shoes this, uh, this week. You have to look at everything. And, yeah. And, and then, of course, you start having uh, kids, and it's, it's, uh, then you feel really bad. 
That's what a lot of people are, are going through that you're listening today and you are a single mother or you're married or a man that's uh, listening and you have found yourself, uh, you've lost your job and now you've got to support your children. I thought that Patrice had some really, really great advice and that part of that is that don't expect to get out of the situation, the dilemma, overnight. Sometimes it takes a while to get in there, the tough situation. It doesn't mean you're going to get out overnight. Would you agree with that statement? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I probably, between my ADD and my, uh, you know, just wanting to get things done uh, quickly, Many times I have put myself into a position where you, you almost double fail. Okay. Because you think you can get out of something quickly because you think you're smart. But some things just have to take their time. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, God wants us to go through the trial in order to get to the other side. Look at the Bible. It's all over the place. You know, the Israelites, I mean, they they wanted things to happen overnight, but they didn't. Ha- it, it didn't happen. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, so, look, there's a learning curve, but I think you have to feel the pain a little bit Okay. to get to the other side. I want to get to this side of you, David, though, because we were talking about David facing his giants here, his Goliaths, is that, you know, when you're used to people looking up to you and you have this certain image, right? Yeah. But you know now within yourself, doggone it, I am struggling. Take me to that feeling, those emotions. What else was going through your mind and through your soul? There's nothing like going through a divorce and coming out of that divorce, losing virtually everything. Yes. I went through a very, very dark period, and I took my eye off the ball. I really did not want to uh, uh, live. I really did not want to... Let's just say for eight months, I stared at a at a wall. You know, I didn't pick up one phone call. I didn't want to make one business move. I let my world fall apart around me. And then you get into a situation that you end up losing your home. You end up losing a lot that you've had around you your entire life. So I've been there. I've been there. I've, I've done that. I've felt the pain. I felt the shame. But you know what? We live in a great great country. Yeah, we, and we live in a great country of many, many opportunities and second chances. And we, we, we believe in a, in a God of second, third, fourth chances. That's one of the themes of this show. And that is, hey, by the way, we're all screw ups. Exactly. You know, and we've all been, we've all been there in different ways. We can share these stories. And I will tell you that uh, I'm a better man today for going through that I make wiser decisions. I also take time to really think through the ramifications of some of those decisions as opposed to uh, flying by the seat of my pants. I think that's wisdom. And the other thing is that I really am very careful as to uh, who I surround myself with. Yes. Because you surround yourself with the wrong people, uh, you're going to make bad choices, and th- that includes bad financial choices. Yes. The humility is a very powerful thing. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and what? He shall lift you up. And sometimes even our bad choices can bring us to a place of humility, which brings us to a place on our knees, mm-hmm. and then he'll lift us up. And that's what I see in your life. I, I feel that... No matter what has happened in your life, David Sams, you just keep on rising up. And and that's what is so important, as we heard even in the interview with Patrice Washington, well, God turned her test into a testimony and her mess into a message. Now, we wish that never happened. We wish that was never written in the script, right? But it did happen. And in the humility of you having to seek the Lord— Wow. He gave you new God ideas, didn't he? Well, that's the thing. He he does give you new God ideas. And I don't think we'd be so open to him unless we were on our, you know, brought to our knees. I, I know myself, 
if I look back through my life, it, it was the pain that brought me great gain. Pain brought me great gain, much more so than just being happy-go-lucky. Luck doesn't bring you the gain. Yeah. Okay? And, and if you do get lucky, maybe you get lucky once in life. Yeah, and I, the other thing, David Sams, is you know what it's like to be the boy wonder. A lot of people don't. But to be the boy wonder, to go to the boy I wonder. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't feel too good, right? Right, 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 right. Yes. The boy wonder of, wow, look what he's doing. Look at all these shows. He's working with Merv Griffin, Oprah Winfrey. He's working with Pat Sajak. Look at all the things that he's doing. And then to, boy, I wonder. Not saying that they wondered, but you wondered. Mm -hmm. When you begin to doubt yourself, not a good place to be. I think doubt is probably the one thing that has the potential of handicapping us the most. Wow. Because it's just like uh, worry. Mm -hmm. You know, doubt, worry. And there, there is a difference between the two. You know, worry is something that is just such a big waste of time. Yes. If you really think about it. Yes. Worry just robs you of your creativity. Doubt, on the other hand, that is something to me that is a big, big... Doubt is the black hole. Yes. And I know a lot of folks listening to this right now, they doubt a lot of things. Maybe they doubt their spouse or their, their significant other. Maybe they doubt their, their job, mm -hmm. whether it's going to be there tomorrow. Are my kids ever going to uh, be able to rise up and, and take care of themselves? Yes. Because they can't get their 35-year-old to move out of the house. You know I mean? They just doubt, 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 right? So these and are th some... That, that's, uh, by the way, that is a lonely place. Lonely is, place to, to be. And what you're talking about today, David Sams, as David is facing his Goliaths, is life lessons. And so a couple of things that I do hear you saying, number one is that God can turn this around, right? Right. But another thing I'm hearing you saying is you by, have to by the cooperate. Way, by the way, Tim, you just said something. God yeah. can turn this around. Okay. Isn't it amazing that we believe in a God that has the potential of turning anything around? I know I bring up here from time to time, it must be a lonely place for people who are non-believers. Yes. But can you imagine not having the faith that we have in a God that can turn it around? And once again, it would mean that we have to do it ourselves. Wow, wow, wow. Yes. I, I can't imagine having that on my shoulder. So for anyone listening right now, if you have somebody that you absolutely love, I mean, just, you know, whether it's a friend, whether it's a, a relative, whoever, and they just can't believe that there is a God who can help them through all the, of these things. Yes. You know, sometimes you just have to take some of the most, the simplest concepts and explain to them. The, the one thing I explain to some of my non-believer friends, who, by the way, a few have become believers, is... Why in the world would you want to go through this alone and feel all the pressure? Why would you want to do that? There is no reason to do There's that. There's no reason at all. You are listening to CIA, and this is Contagious Influences of America. We had as a guest today a wonderful woman. You enjoy her, don't you? Patrice Washington. We're also talking to David Sam's nine-time Emmy Award winner, and I love that he opens up, tells us about his life, and realizes that, hey, we're all going through recovery and discovery at the same time. Just for one moment, I have a new app on iTunes, and it's called the Utmost App. So you can just see the Utmost App on iTunes. My name is Tim Story, S-T-O-R-E-Y. David Sams, man, what a show. Can you tell the people where they can listen to this? Yeah, we've made it really, really easy to listen. You can find us on Apple Podcast, Podcast Addict, Alexa. Yes. You can just go on Alexa and say, Alexa, play the latest episode of CIA Contagious Influencers of America podcast from iHeartRadio, and Alexa will just play the latest episode 
or of course, we have made it really, really, really cool. We've put the podcast here on YouTube, and we have a special channel on YouTube for we this. Sure do. And uh, you can go to uh, Contagious Influencers or Contagious Encouragement on YouTube and uh, play it. And th the really cool thing about YouTube is that we've added some pictures, so you know you can kind of see the person and have a uh, a reference as to what we're talking about and who the guest is. Mm -hmm. That's kind of fun. Did you enjoy this show? Oh, I, you know what? I enjoy this more and more every episode because we are finding all of these amazing influencers from all over the world believers. Okay? Yes. These are believers. These are people who share our faith. You know, it's amazing to me that Christian television can have all of these pastors on there. Yes. Right? Uh, everybody behind a pulpit. Et cetera, et cetera. But I don't see any of these stories that we're talking about. No, these are these are real stories. These are the real people. Real life. Real life. Very Old Testament and New Testament. I think we need to reinvent Christian television and put some real life on these channels. I yeah. really do. Because these are amazing stories. I mean, we have people who have accomplished amazing things. They have gone through the fire. They have taken the world by storm. They have reinvented themselves. They have done amazing things from Scott Hamilton to Mark Burnett and Roma Downey, now Patrice Washington. I'm loving what we're doing here, my friend. I'm loving what we're doing. We're changing lives. Make sure and share, 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 because we care. David Sams, give me that amazing conclusion you do about life in color. Please give that to us. You know, for many, many, many of my years, and I'm sure some of you share this same sort of uh, outlook on life, and that is, you know, we have our ways. We kind of wake up in the morning. We do things the same way. It's sort of a little bit of a member of the movie Groundhog Day. Oh, yeah. Um, and I just decided a while back, I, I realized my closet was full of black shirts, okay. white shirts, yep. gray shirts, blue shirts, right? Not anymore. And I'm, I'm talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of shirts that are black or white. So I decided to change it up a little bit because I believe in being a, a chameleon. Because if you're not a chameleon, if you're not changing as quickly as the world is changing and you're not feeling the moment uh, that the world is uh, in, you're a dinosaur if you're not a chameleon. So I decided to change up my shirts. And I stumbled across the most amazing shirts they just blew me away. They're called dashikis. They're African. I'm telling you right now, you wear one of these into Publix. Yes. Or one of these into uh, Vons. Anywhere. Right? And you are a chick magnet. No, I believe it. I've seen it. <laughs> uh, I, I saw you at a Michael Mina restaurant, and it was like... If, it, it was like if... Uh, Wait, have I left you speechless? A major celebrity. <laughs> A major celebrity just walked in. Brad Pitt. <laughs> so, and my daughter came up with a great brand for these shirts. She goes, Dad, you got to call these Dashiki Dave. I like that. So I'm, I'm calling the shirts Dashiki Dave. They're called Dashikis, which means shirt. They're very colorful. Right? You know what? I will put a fashion show up there on the on the uh, new website. And who, who's going to be modeling them? You. <laughs> Can we get Brad Pitt? <laughs> that, that might help sales a little bit, right? Hey, listen, uh, we, we really appreciate you listening. Remember, go out there and live that life in living color because it is sure a lot more fun than living it in black and white. We'll see you next time.